Hi, Stephanie. Happy to have you Hi. here with the Echo Sprinter. How are you? I am fine. Thank you for having me here. That's uh, it's amazing to be able to talk to Echo Sprinter always. That's nice. No, so nice for us to speak with you and with the other of the executive committee. Let's dive into the questions. The first one is: Please introduce yourself to the Echo Sprinter readers. So hi again, I'm Stephanie, I'm 25 years old. Uh, I'm from Belgium, from a city called Ghent, uh, and I think it's the best city in the world. Uh, you should all come and visit me. And I am, I am a campaigner at the Flemish peace organization called Vedas Axie, if you would translate it into English, that's peace action. And uh, so my days consist of campaigning against the arms trade and uh, yeah, having uh, organizing actions and mobilizing people. And then of course, I'm also the co-spokesperson of FIG since um, the GA this year. So yeah, that's a bit who I am. Yeah. And I have a cat called yeah, Oedipus. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, one cat called Oedipus and he's here, but he doesn't want to be in the screen. <laughs> <laughs> he's shy for the moment. He's shy. Describe yourself in three to five words. Oh my god, a uh, difficult one. I would say that I'm an activist, so one word. Yeah. Uh, the second one is hopeful. And the third one is uh, always smiling. Or something <laughs> like this. <laughs> Indeed true. Number three, what is your main focus for the mandate? So of course, as co-spokesperson, I'll be focusing on a lot of things and, and making sure that FIG is represented to the outside world, but also I mean inside, I think for me, team building and having a federation where everyone is very happy and, and likes to come and change the world um, is yeah, is super important. Um, but politically, I think, of course, COP26 com coming up will be a very important milestone for us and also very important to make sure that we get to say and um, also have a bit of influence because it's it's indeed a super important COP. And then next to this, I'm also uh, focusing on international relations, uh, on migration and on human rights, uh, of course, because that's also related to what I do as a job uh, for my job. Yeah. So yeah, that will be that's my nice. focus. That's a nice focus. What is the role of the Green Movement in the place that you are from? So I'm a member, of course, of Young Groen, um, who are the Flemish Young Greens or the Flemish speaking Young Greens. Um, and then Belgium is quite complex um, because we also have a French speaking side in Belgium and they have Ecologie as a, as a member party of which I'm also a member. Um, so yeah, what well, the green movement now are in a lot of governments since um, two years now. So since 2019, uh, we are in the federal government where we have some ministers and deputy prime ministers like Petra de Sitter, who you might know, uh, but also Tina van der Straten from Groen. Um, but we're also in the government on Brussels level, on Walloon level. So the green movement is a, a bit of a transition. Um, we're both in government, but also there are lots of climate activists, of course, still taking the streets on the 10th of October, for example, there will be a yeah. climate march in uh, in Brussels again. So, um, I mean, it's a quite diverse movement, the green movement. And in Young Groen, for example, you'll have people who are in the city council or in a local council or people who are in parliament. But at the same time, you also have people who are more activists uh, focusing on uh, going to the streets, uh, which I think is, is amazing. And um, if you look at the Cospox people, Jordi and Paola, they are also um, trying to um, help and support both of these kind of things. Uh, so both being active in the streets and in parliaments. Uh, so that's a bit, yeah, where the green movement is active and, and is trying to influence policy. Yeah. So, as I'm all from the west central part of Europe and uh, of an NO member organization. Uh, my next question is how to increase the representation of the Eastern and Southern European MOs in FIEC? 
I think that's a very important question and something um, really we also really want to focus on this year. Um, I am uh, also the uh, rep responsible for the South MOs. Uh, so meaning I will be uh, joining the regional meetings and I'm also responsible for some uh, MOs like the Spanish Young Greens, Portuguese Young Greens, uh, the Italian Young Greens. So that's a lot of fun um, and I've been doing this uh, this specific role also the past two years so I've seen in corona times how difficult it was also to organize uh, and I think like this year we have a chance to really come together and for example if I look at the southern region um, I think we benefit a lot from um, cooperating because the MOs in it are quite diverse but your challenges are really the same um, so it's, it really helps just having a regional meeting every now and then and trying to come up with a, a common campaign focusing on a topic that is happening everywhere in Southern Europe, for example. Um, so, and learning from each other because some MOs might exist already a bit longer, some are new. So like all these different things uh, combined together and working together really helps in developing your organization more, but also learning more. And uh, yeah, I think it also helps in getting a better representation within FIG. Uh, and also, I mean, sometimes it's also a bit about confidence because I think the Southern MOs and the Eastern MOs are uh, the coolest. Um, and I think um, it's really like sometimes speaking, coming from a Center West MO, <laughs> sometimes they think like, we're the best, but actually, for me, it's been three years of learning a lot from the South MOs. Um, so yeah, that's that's where I think a lot of cooperation yeah. can come from. As I well. get your point. Cooperation between the MOs will indeed help yes. because they usually face similar problems. Yeah, when, of, of like yeah? like the MO trainings as well. They they will help, or the MO trainings that are planned right now as well. They will also be very important and very interesting to to yeah. focus on and to to follow also the, the previous mo's to mo the event about social yes. media were in yes. yeah. next question is about rights and is how can we achieve stronger lgbtqi plus rights that's of course a big question i think for me um there's still a lot to do um and there's still like we're not there yet um if you look at whatever like all the things happening over the summer in poland in hungary um so i think one of the key things is the representation um making sure that everyone has a seat at the table um and that decisions are always taken as with a diverse public um so meaning that LGBTQI plus people also get a, a seat at the table. Um, and that, um, of course, that we make sure that their voices are also heard, um, which is super important. And next to this, um, I think it's also still important to take the streets. Um, we've seen big pride marches um, this summer as well, for example, in Budapest. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's both of these things and they are equally important. Um, we should be at the table where the decisions are made and we should also be in the streets demanding our rights. Um, so for me, that's a bit where we will focus on in the next few months as well. Yeah, indeed. My next question is about the current uh, situation in Afghanistan, consider it uh, your main focus is during your mandate. And it is, what is your stance on the European approach to the Afghan crisis? So, I mean, there are, of, of course, a lot of facets to it. Um, and I think the one I know the most of is um, the fact that, I mean, how we dealt with this crisis is really something that we should learn of and something that we should evaluate as well um, and um, of course that's true for all military interventions um, because we should evaluate like was this the right response should we have been there um, and then of course also um, we will uh, we also deal with 
Um, there will also, of course, be extra uh, people fleeing the country, of course, fleeing for their lives, fleeing for uh, human rights violations. And I think that's also where we will need to see the leadership of the European Union, um, because and up until now, the migration politics of the European Union is really something horrible. Um, if we look at how, like just now today, there was again a report of how people are violently, violently pushed back at the borders um, and how this is also financed by uh, the European Union. Um, and I think that's something we should really, <laughs> that's also something we should learn from this Afghan crisis. Like if, people are fleeing their country for war, for human rights violations, for whatever, like just fleeing to find a secure life for themselves, for their families. They should find a home in Europe as well. And we shouldn't fortify our, our countries and or our borders. Um, and um, as you might know, FIG is also a very uh, ardent supporter of abolish Frontex because Frontex is one of those agencies for me that is really shows how Europe has been dealing with the migrant crisis. Or I don't like to call it a migrant crisis because it's not a crisis of migrants. It's, it's a crisis of how we deal with this. Um, we are actively pushing people back. We are actively uh, aiding the so-called Libyan go coast guards um, in human rights violations. And for me, that's something that the EU, I guess, I can't believe that uh, of course, I can't believe that we are aiding in this and that we are still facilitating this. Um, so that's one of the lessons or one of the things that we will have to look at Europe, how they are, how we will deal with this in the coming months and something we will actively, of course, push for an inclusive Europe, a welcoming Europe uh, where Frontex is, does not exist and where we have an agency that actually welcomes uh, people who are fleeing uh, their countries. Yeah, I think that's an answer that uh, who who is who will view the video will appreciate about these values, about integrating, about understanding why people flee from their country, not giving for granted that they're numbers or objects, but they're actually people that come to mm -hmm. their frontiers. And I'll just follow with the next question, and it's an easy one. It's just what is one <laughs> what is one green recommendation you have for our readers? So I don't know who reads the motivation letters and uh, or the candidacies at the at the GA, but uh, for those who do, they might already know mine um, because my recommendation would be the book called Hope in the Dark by Rebecca Solnit. It's a book. Um, about, so basically it was written just after Bush got reelected for the second time. So after the big peace mobilizations against the war in Iraq and still Bush got reelected and it felt like this uh, dark time where uh, people were very desperate or didn't know like, why are we still organizing? Why are we still active? They made a second take of this book just after Trump got elected because of course for a lot of movements in the US, this was kind of the same feeling. And I think it's still valid today uh, because it talks a lot about, um, yeah, what hope actually is and how we can organize and how we should organize what is important in, in, in this. And um, one of the things you will definitely remember if you read the book is that hope is not like something that is super optimistic and will definitely be a good world. It's actually being super um, straightforward and knowing that it will not be easy, but that we will get there in the long run. So if you look at the climate crisis today and in the mobilizations today, we know that like, if you look at the plans that the national governments are proposing at COP26, we see that it will not be enough but we keep mobilizing and we keep um, going through the streets. We make sure that FIG's voice is heard. Um, and that way we know that in the long run, we will get, uh, and we, we know that we will, yeah, continue struggling for what we need and the future we, we want. Um, so that's a bit that I would really recommend it because if you read it, then you will see how 
hopeful it is, but also how encouraging it is um, to focus on it. So a book about hope that can drive activism toward climate uh, resilience, I would say. Yeah, activism, but also like in political parties and how political parties can organize and about how important imagination is. Yeah, it's a book about a lot of things and it's not super big. So even if you don't like reading, it's, it's the best book. <laughs> can you please repeat the title and the author just for those who didn't hear it it's, before? Uh, it's Hope in the Dark and the author is Rebecca Solnit. You might also know her from um, Men Explaining Things to Me. That's also oh. a very famous book from her. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Stephanie, for the interview. Thank you for the interview. I hope it was okay. Yeah, <laughs> sure will. Yeah. And I hope you'll have a, a great night being 20 already. You too. You too. Thank you. Have fun in Leuven. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.